Hi, curious people. Let's talk about one of my favorite topics, the history of technology. Today, I want to take you back to the origins of the telegraph. I know, I know, it's old, but stay with me though. It's a great example of a race to turn a new discovery into something useful. Let's look at where it came from, how it worked, and who became giants because of it. This little thing spawned a revolution. And many of the companies and industries that started it are still with us today. So let's dive in. First, we need a timeline. Welcome to the beginning of time. Well, the beginning of our tale anyway. So, how did people send quick messages over long distances? Pigeon? Uh, something called the optical telegraph, or semaphore, has existed since 1792. Think of it as a really big signal flag, like those you see on ships or naval vessels. They spread all over continental Europe during the Napoleonic Wars. Better than signal pigeon, but not much better than a signal fire. It only gained over alerting the elves by sending some information along. You can't fight Mordor if you don't know where you're going. If you want something fast, we need a pile of creativity. A pile! In 1799, Alessandro Volta creates his pile that generates an electric potential, something we'll later call a voltage. How cool. This is the first battery and a much needed source of electric current. Power on tap. <laughs> we need to meet a few other people to turn this into a telegraph though. Fast forward a bit and we're in the age of discovery. By the 1820s, Faraday, Orsted, and many others have delved deeper into the mysteries of electric currents. Faraday, this guy, conducted his induction experiment in 1832. This is a big deal, as it showed another way to make a current by moving a magnet. It also showed the reverse. Currents can move things. And that opens up a world of potential. Heh. <laughs> Word travels fast, or as fast as letter mail would allow. Investors scramble to learn more. This is where we need to step aboard the package ship Sully, crossing the Atlantic from France to the United States. To meet an, an artist, actually. An artist. We have to meet an artist. Samuel Morse, a 41-year-old artist, was a painter, but one that was curious about the mechanical nature of the world. He was so fascinated by the new discoveries that we just talked about that he put aside his latest painting, The Gallery of the Louvre, to travel the world and find out more. In October of 1832, aboard our ship Sully, we find Morse sharing the ship with Charles Thomas Jackson, a graduate of Harvard Medical School, a fiery fellow, and a proclaimed adept in these new sciences. What would happen if you cut a circuit under a voltage? It would spark anywhere you cut it. How long does it take a circuit to react to being cut. Seemingly instantaneously. The pieces were there and Morse saw them. Using batteries, currents, and induction of movement, one could cause an action instantly at a distance. A new mechanism to communicate was being born. Morse better move fast though. The idea was novel. But he was not the first. Three other groups were hard at work developing a similar system. Pavel Schilling, that same year, 1832, demonstrated his version of the telegraph in St. Petersburg, Russia. Unfortunately, he died before he could bring his invention to the market. Wilhelm Weber and Carl Gauss one year later, in 1833, yeah, 
that goes. The magnetic fields and the probabilities and statistics and distributions goes. Well, they built a system to link their mountaintop observatory to the labs in the valley below. They didn't bring theirs to market either though. William Cook and Charles Wheatstone in the UK a few years later, in 1836, they did create a six wire version, which could map letters by combination. The race was on with these gents as their telegraph was on track to become the de facto standard in the British Empire. Getting this thing to work was no trivial task. Remember, they had no idea of any of the design principles that we take for granted. Morris enlists the help of Alfred Vail, an American machinist and inventor. After graduating from the University of the City of New York in 1836, Vail became so interested in Morse's telegraph and the experiments he was doing to get it to work that he had to join him. It's a good thing too. Together they developed a forerunner for the modern international Morse code. And that is one of the essential things that makes their telegraph work and its ability to triumph over others. It's the reason why a single wire Morse telegraph can do the same job as a six wire Wheatstone Cook telegraph with its combinations. Sometimes you need a good partner to create a great idea. Together, they set to work on building prototypes. The telegraph is immensely simple by today's standards, but represents a moment that has no parallel, except for the introduction of electrical power itself. Let's look deeper into what Morse and Vail were up to. The first prototype of the telegraph had four major components. The battery, that's this right here, you know it, but we need Volta's invention here too. It provided the current to generate our action at a distance. Second is the key, this thing. In modern language, it's a switch. Yeah, yeah, a switch, but it has some special properties. It's spring-loaded and well-balanced for speed. So you get that distinct tack, 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 tack. Being able to rapidly open and close, the circuit makes Morse's dots and dashes possible. At the other end, we have the sounder, which is this, or the other end. It can be a lever much like the key, but at the other end of the circuit. It doesn't send, it only receives. But its action is driven by an electromagnet in the bottom. The sounder must close, click, and open quickly, just as quickly as the key to give that classic clack. This allows the dots and the dashes to be distinguished from Morse's code. Too slow and all the dots become dashes. And lastly is the circuit itself. It's a conductor for a message. It's simple really, but it's actually the largest component and the most prone to loss. Later, it will travel on railways, linking the sounder to the key across nations. How did our protagonists test this thing out? Well, they did it at the Speedwell Ironworks in Morristown, New Jersey, on January 11th, 1838. Morse and Mail made the first public demonstration of the electric telegraph. It was missing one part though, the repeater. And we'd need this for its final use case. So the range of the test system was limited to two miles. And funny enough, the inventors had wrapped the factory in exactly that, two miles of wire, 3.2 kilometers. That day, they were able to send the first message by Morse code. A patient waiter is no loser. The missing piece though, was the relay. Morse and Vale had to enlist another friend to figure this out. They needed insights from Professor Leonard Gale, who taught chemistry at New York University. He was a personal friend of Joseph Henry, 
who is also of electromagnetism fame. So with his help, Morse and Vale introduced extra circuits or relays at frequent intervals, and soon they were able to send messages up to 10 miles, 16 kilometers. And that same year, 1838, Morse traveled to Washington, D.C. to seek U.S. federal sponsorship for the telegraph, building a line. But he wasn't actually successful. So he turned to Europe, and he went there looking for sponsorship and patents, but faced competitors there too. Cook and Wheatstone, who we just talked about, had built a toehold there. And after his return to the U.S., Morse gave it another try and finally gave financial gained financial backing from a Maine congressman. And that was a moment where things changed for us all. The telegraph expanded quickly across the Americas. Well, let's fast forward a bit. The next few decades started generating companies and institutions that would last for centuries. In the 1850s, the Western Union Telegraph Company, founded in part by Ezra Cornell, does that sound familiar? Was at first only one of many small telegraph operators. But by 1861, however, Western Union had laid the first transcontinental telegraph line. And it became the first nationwide telegraph company. That's pretty amazing. Improvements to the system continued through the late 1800s. Ezra Cornell, him again, pioneered insulators to reduce distortion and loss. It kept the lines separate from what they were connected to. Another improvement by the famed inventor Thomas Alva Edison, if you've heard of him, in 1874 introduced the quadruplex system, allowing four messages to be transmitted simultaneously using the same four wire or <laughs> the same one wire system. Over 40 years, the fledging idea turned from something small to giant companies and institutions and generated fortunes. Morse himself had grown quite wealthy based on these ideas, something that was just a thought he was pursuing on the packet ship Sully. By the 1870s, the British General Post Office would acquire the British Cook Wheatstone Telegraph System. They would eventually replace that system with Morse's. Victory, old chap! As well, the general post office system is still with us today. It would eventually become British Telecom. And British Telecom would expand greatly with a brand new upstart of engine, the telephone, to create the telegraph. No one here discovered electromagnetism or any fundamental science. They found out about it, but they didn't discover it. Many teams were working at the same time Wearing up word of mouth and novel approaches they encountered as they made their way through the world. They raced against time to find an application for a new science. When I was first studying engineering, one professor of mine of an elementary coding course told us, never write something that already exists. Leverage and borrow components wherever you can. At first I laughed. Why wouldn't I write it myself? Then I started coding and realized how much effort every component takes to create, even if it's an element that I didn't even care about. It was far better to spend that effort on new elements or combining elements into a new system. It's really just sound time management advice. Build on what others have created. Build it well enough and others will build on top of you. Part of why I'm telling you these things is so that you can learn from other people's projects. Some of them were able to seize the opportunity to build something amazing. So can you. Never be afraid to create and build on giants, my friends. Until next time, keep creating. <laughs>